Hello and welcome to the Literary Lair, and to the second week of Classic Novel Month 5, the final read tier. month, a new Planet of the Apes movie comes to theaters. But did you know that Planet of the Apes started out as a book? Oh, you did? Um, well, did you know that the author, Pierre Boulle, also wrote Bridge on the River Kwai? Bet you didn't know that. Planet of the Apes is regarded by many to be one of the most classic movies ever, with one of the best twist endings in all of cinema. And it's pretty quotable, too. It's no surprise that it's been parodied in several shows and movies and even web series. It even spawned five movies, two television series of varying quality, an attempted reboot and a successful reboot, plus comics, toys, and video games. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. But what about the original novel? Does it hold up to the movie? Is it like Jurassic Park, equally beloved compared to its adaptation? Or is it more like Paper Towns? The adaptation is superior in almost every way. Let's find out. It's time to go to a world where apes evolved from man. This is Planet of the Apes. The cover is... eh. At least on the edition I read, which I think is a tie-in made sometime around the 2001 movie, so that would explain that. As far as I can tell about the first edition, it was just text, and I sort of get it. It would ruin the twist, but I don't know. I sort of figured that there would be more interesting covers akin to the original movie poster. Though, I suppose that the story would have to be in an unassuming package. Anyway, let's get to the story itself. The story is framed around a letter discovered in space by a couple, Jin and Phyllis, which tells the story of Ulysses Moreau, a journalist who was on a space voyage with two scientists, Professor Antel and Arthur, to test a faster-than-light engine in the year 2500. They went up and set off for Beetlejuice to likely meet with the people behind the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and change Earth's entry to something besides mostly harmless. The only catch is that in the two years that it'll take to get there, and the two years to get back, due to time dilation, centuries will pass on Earth. So that means that they've also invented one-way time travel that takes four years to work. Neat. The voyage is mostly uneventful, and they end up orbiting a planet that they name Soror. They take a landing craft down and find that the planet is identical to Earth in almost every way. They find a woman, but she doesn't seem to speak and is frightened of their pet chimpanzee, Hector, killing him. But it's alright, they just need their other ape, Jaime, to repair him with technology from his magic space scarab. Was that a reach for a Blue Beetle reference? Yes. Yes, it was. They rush back to their landing craft, but the woman, Nova, and her tribe destroy the craft and their clothing, just in time for gorillas in clothing and walking on two legs to show up and start hunting the humans. <laughs> 
including Ulysses and his compatriots. Antel and Ulysses are captured and separated, and Arthur is killed, with Ulysses being kept in some scientific institute for studying slash testing. He is paired off with Nova for breeding purposes, as they perform tests on the humans akin to how on Earth we tested apes and monkeys. Ulysses even recognizes one of the tests as Pavlov's dog. I guess you could say that it rang a bell. That joke was terrible, I apologize, I'll escort myself out. He eventually learns their language and starts talking, but the head of the science institute, Dr. Zayas... Dr. Zayas, Dr. Zayas! Not... Well, you got me there. Zayas, an orangutan, in his infinite wisdom, assumes that he's just mimicking the apes, like a parrot. I don't know much about the science of animals talking, but if a monkey started talking to me in English, I think I'd be a little more willing to believe that it has human levels of intelligence and would converse with it. Regardless, it's eventually noticed by a female chimp named Zira, who Ulysses eventually gains the trust of, and he lets her in on his origins. He asks her to help him gain his freedom so he can find Antel and return to their ship, and after she talks it over with her husband Cornelius, a scientist who also studies humans, they get together and put him in front of the Ape Council to show that he's not of their world. He has to prove to them that he is not like the other humans. For example, he likes sports and plays Xbox. He proves himself to the council against the behest of Zaius and gets to live a relatively normal life. Well, as normal as his life can be as the only intelligent human on the planet. He finds Antel, but he's regressed to being a savage and shows no signs of his former self, and so Ulysses is forced to abandon him. Cornelius invites Ulysses on an archaeological dig where they find something rather disturbing to the apes. A doll. Normally that wouldn't be a big deal, but the doll wasn't modeled after an ape, it was modeled after a human, much like the ones that Ulysses had seen many times on Earth, leading Ulysses and Cornelius to believe that Soror might have been at one point more identical to Earth than they thought, including a human society. Cornelius sends Ulysses home, and later Ulysses falls ill for a while, and when he awakes, Nova has been moved from the Institute. At first, Ulysses is worried, but Cornelius tells him that Nova was moved because she's pregnant with Ulysses' child. Yeah, while they were caged up together, they sort of... Zaius is going to want to study the kids, so they have to get them far away. But Cornelius and Zira are smart. They have a plan. There's a space capsule set to go up into orbit with a family of three humans going up in it as a scientific test. Cornelius and Zira have enough pull that they can replace the humans with Ulysses and his new family, and adjust the trajectory so that he can pilot it back to a spaceship to return home. And it works. They head up, and Ulysses, Nova, and his son Sirius who can talk as well as any other baby, saying Mama and Dada, journey back to Earth, landing in France, naturally, and are approached by a truck carrying two very odd-looking beings. Two gorillas. The three humans flee the planet, and Ulysses sends out his message that was found by Phyllis and Jin. They finish reading the letter, and Phyllis and Jin express disbelief. I mean, intelligent humans? That's preposterous. It's revealed that they too are apes as the story ends. We'll be right back with more of the show. And did you know that Pierre Boulle won an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for a screenplay that he didn't even write? I'll tell you how after these messages. We're back, and Pierre Boulle was given the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay for the film adaptation of his novel Bridge on the River Kwai, despite not writing the screenplay, because the two guys who did write it, Carl Foreman and Michael Wilson, had been blacklisted as communist sympathizers during the Red Scare. That's... I can't even make a joke about that. That's messed up. 
The characters in this book are amazing. It's no wonder why they became enduring in the history of cinema. Ulysses is basically George Taylor from the movie, and you really feel for him, considering that he's kept in captivity for months. Although I put part of the blame on him for not telling them his entire story from day one. He's extremely developed as an extremely intelligent man in his own right, and he manages to retain his sanity in the face of his captivity, unlike Antel. Though, for all we know, Antel may have suffered a head injury or had a psychotic break, contributing to the loss of his humanity. Zeus is a jackass, but I love how they explain the cast of the ape society that made him that way. They have chimpanzees who do all the work, being intellectual, scientists, doctors, and just regular citizens. Orangutans who all act smart, but are really just parroting stuff they heard other orangutans say, and so are the priests, politicians, and head scientists of the world. And the gorillas, who are the tanks. I mean, soldiers, hunters, laborers, and general authority figures. The separate classes give the ape society a little something extra. A lesser novelist would have just made them all chimps or all gorillas, but this story takes three established primates and makes them into a society. And it makes sense. Chimpanzees are the most human-looking of the apes, and so naturally that they would be the default. And then you have specialized classes for the larger and sometimes more intelligent apes. I just love how they develop Zeus into this close-minded guy who refuses to believe in anything new. Something that I'm happy that we don't have to deal with in our modern, enlightened society. Zira and Cornelius are great, being the two most agreeable apes in the novel. I appreciate how much they help Ulysses, even though they have no reason to. It's nice to see that despite their differences, apes and humans can get along, provided they both put in the work to establish the relationship. Nova doesn't really have a character since she doesn't speak or show signs of higher thought aside from killing Hector. Other than that, there aren't that many major characters that get that much focus. I mean, we've got Antel, but he's only there for a few chapters, and I mean, I guess Phyllis and Jin are major, but they're really only important in the framing narrative and don't have any traits other than married couple. Oh my god, the twist ending. I wish that Planet of the Apes wasn't so ingrained in our pop culture, because the twist ending is so good. If I had went into this completely blind, it would have blown my damn mind. I'll get to the other action in a minute, but let's deconstruct this first. Imagine, as hard as it might be, if you didn't know how Planet of the Apes ended. The book starts out fairly normal, and even knowing the ending, for a few pages, I thought that Phyllis and Jin were humans. And they say some innocuous things in reaction to the letter, like, The Human Race, which scans as more disbelief in a world where apes evolved from man rather than the other way around. Then you read through this whole book and you're like, wow, a sister planet where apes became the dominant species? How interesting. I wonder what Earth is going to be like when he gets back. And then Ulysses gets back to Earth and boom, he's been gone so long, the same fate has befallen his home planet. And more than that, those two space travelers from the beginning, they're apes too. It's one of the greatest twists in all of literature. But it's ruined because I already knew the ending. I really wish I could wipe my memory of the twist so that I could experience it properly. It's that good. Other than that, the action is almost non-stop. There's real tension with Ulysses' plight, especially at first when he doesn't know what's going on. It evolves from there to a grudging acceptance until Zira and Cornelius show up, and then it's a really fascinating look at the inner machinations of the ape planet. I know the movie gave us a taste, but the book really takes us into ape society, which in the book feels more like early 20th century Earth, but with monkeys. Even though I knew the ending, I was still on the edge of my seat every time it looked grave for Ulysses. Bull perfectly executes all of the action and brilliantly writes out conversations about the world he's created. I didn't want to put down the book the entire time I was reading it and was eager to see where it would go next. The book is utterly, utterly fantastic. My only issue is that everyone already knows the ending, so the amazing punks that the twist should have had is only a vague, ha, huh, so it's a little different than the movie. 
The story is inspired, the characters are brilliant, and the action is well-paced and perfectly conveyed to the reader. Pierre Boulle is a fantastic author, and this has become one of my favorite books. I'm just still so mad about the fact that no one can ever experience the twist properly thanks to the pop culture lexicon. Overall, Planet of the Apes definitely deserves to be considered a classic and is just as good, if not even better, than the classic film that was adapted from it. I highly recommend it if you like sci-fi or if you're a fan of the film, because if you like the film, there's more to love in the pages of the original novel. And that was Planet of the Apes. Was it good? Go back to the beginning and watch the video again if you don't already know the answer to this. Planet of the Apes was great, and I'm happy, considering that this is the final classic novel month, that we're going out on such a high note with these books so far. I just wish Pierre Boulle got more recognition, since most people only know the movies. Check out the novel. It deserves more love than it gets, like most books that were adapted for film. But considering how the film deviates from the novel, even more so with this one. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of the literary Larry, you can hit that subscribe button. And if you have any comments or complaints about the video, you can put those in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, show it to your friends and share it around the internet. And maybe consider supporting the show on Patreon. Oh, and press that bell next to the subscribe button to get notified of new uploads if that's something you're interested in. Come back next week for a book that Oh, uh, sorry. First rule of Classic Novel Month is you don't talk about Classic Novel Month. See you next time. and this has become one of my favorite books. I'm just still so mad that no one can ever experience the twist. Can I stop spinning?